And with the talk I gave, if you know the answer, shout them out. So um, let's. This, this is a good time to use that worksheet that we can, yeah, we can fill just, in. And if there's not enough space to fill in everything, of course, just fill in the ones you're interested in. So the easy to save seeds are. The reason we've got them in this category is they're selfers. So for the most part, they tend not to outcross. So it's pretty easy. You can grow them and, you know, without too much to do, you can get seed and, um, uh, so what do we have on our worksheet? So lettuce. Lettuce is an annual, which means that it it completes its whole growing cycle in one season. It does its vegetative growth, it goes to, sends up a seed stock, goes to seed, produces seed in one growing season. Uh, we, things in this category, the reason they're in this category is because they will require a vernalization period. Um, spinach, not, that isn't the case with spinach, it's in this category for a different reason. But um, a vernalization is what I talked about before, that cold. It needs that cold period, like two months, two to four months of about 40 degrees, which you get on, you know, you get that in the Midwest. Oregon is a big seed growing state. Washington is a big seed growing state. Um, and what happens with these crops is they do all their vegetative growth the first season, and then the second season they go to seed. So um, we do have a farmer who is now doing a project to grow beet to seed. So what, how she's doing that, and we have beets on this. So beets, probably as a home gardener, you're not gonna grow, grow this to seed because you would have to dig it out of the ground at the end of its growing season, so you want to plant it in the spring, grow it through its vegetative stage, pull it out, take a look at the root, is it you know, a nice, you know, how you're doing your selection. What are you selecting for? A nice round bee, doesn't have a lot of pukas in it, whatever. You, you're you determining what you're selecting for. Then they take that bee and they refrigerate it for two to four months. And then in spring, plant it out again and get bee seed. Um, it's, you have to store it in sawdust. You have to make sure it doesn't get too wet or it'll rot. So um, all the plants in this category, with the exception of spinning, that happens. Carrots, recently, a num number of us who have been working together have found a variety that will go to seed in one season, um, the Kadoda. It's a Japanese variety. And people, we say, yay, we got a carrot to go to seed. And some of the seed growers are like, that's not really good. That means it's bolting too early. But in Hawaii, maybe we'll take it. I don't know if we really want to grow carrots to seed. That's a question. Mm -hmm. So there are going to be some things that really just don't even try. Um, so lettuce doesn't need an vernalization. It's an inbreeder. Lettuce is a perfect flower. What happens is the male part, before the flower even opens, the male part goes up through the female part, and it pollinates it. And, the, and it's only, it does it almost before the sun comes up. So there's no pollinators around once that male part comes up into the female part. So even, and I've tried this, if you tie two different varieties together when they're flowering and try to get them to cross so you can make a cross, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. So this is a, lettuce is a strong inbreeder, easy to grow to seed. If you're a little concerned about crossing, you know, separate it by 10, your lettuce varieties by 10 feet. Um, plant spacing with lettuce, if I had a whole field of lettuce, I'd probably space them um, far enough apart, depending on the variety. If it's a big leaf variety, if it's an upright leaf, it's gonna be a little different, but enough so when you know that plant is mature in terms of when you would eat the lettuce, how big it's gonna be, Give it a little space so it gets good aeration. Because that's going to be, you know, you don't want to get all kinds of um, uh, fungal and mold problems. So, um, you know, I would say 15 inches apart and, you know, between rows, comfortable enough that you can walk. But lettuce, um, 
you're going to need to stake it, like I mentioned before. It's, it's going to seed and be like this. Do we have uh, okay, so, so. Pollination, it's a self-pollinator. So there, you don't need to have a pollinator for it. Isolation distance, be, okay, you guys tell me. Because it's a self-pollinator, do you need a big isolation distance? Maybe 10, I wouldn't even do 10 feet. I mean, I grow lettuce in an aquaponic system, um, and I grow it to seed because I want it to adapt to that system. And they're in net pots right next to each other, and I've never had them cross. Um, an interesting way to do an experiment would be to buy a black seeded variety and a white seeded variety. And if when you save your seed, you're getting black and white, what happened? It crossed. So, you know, it's a way to do an experiment with seed color. Um, population size. It's a selfer. Pardon? One to a million. <laughs> One to a million, yeah. Let's say minimum. Minimum population is one. You could do one. But you probably want to do at least five because you want to get some good genetics in there from each plant. Um, uh, and harvest. When do you harvest lettuce seeds? Le that's an interesting one because lettuce, um, each of those, lettuce when it goes to seed is kind of like dandelion. It shoots off and it's got one seed on each of the little florets. Um, and it has a group of florets in its flower. So those seeds are developing at different times. They don't all happen at once, the whole seed head. So um, what you can do is you can either go along and just kind of, you know, as they turn that white fluffy, but they haven't really fall, you know, flown off or shattered, you can pick them out and put them in a bag. Or you can wait until the plant, like, you know, depending how much lettuce seed you need to get. If you get a lot of lettuce seed from one plant. So you could really, when you look at it and say, oh, 50% of the plant's got white fluffy blooms on it, I'm going to cut it now, flip it into a bag, and harvest. Um, and that's generally what most of us do. You don't get all this, you know, you get the, about 50%, which is a lot of seed. Um, and you harvest it when it's at that fluffy stage and dry it again. You want to protect it from moisture, um, or, you're gonna, or the seed's going to rot. So in my aquaponics, I just put that plastic carbonite, polycarbonate, over the top of where I'm growing my lettuce to seed and make sure it's high enough. Um, if you're doing it, one year we did it in the garden, and, um, <laughs> and we don't have protection. So we just took two sawhorses and we built them up with cinder blocks <laughs> and put the polycarbonate across. So you can, you know, be creative. You can do it. Um, and so this process for uh, collecting the seed is the dry process. And we're going to be doing that hands-on, um, but we're going to be doing it with amaranth because right now I don't have lettuce going to seed because it's the wet time. So um, mustard greens are, okay, they're an annual. They don't need fertilization. They will. Outcross, but generally, most people don't care. You got a purple one. They what they do is they they separate. They'll, they'll grow them at separate times, and when they go to seed, you know they'll go to seed at separate times. So you can stagger your growth if you really want like to maintain the purple one. Um, I have grown purple and green together, and it doesn't seem like they cross too readily. Um, and I've grown the seed out again, and it was, it stayed quite, quite consistent. Um, so population size on that, hmm, I would say five to ten plants. Go ahead. So if I want to grow like mizuna, tetsoi, and purple mustard, and green mustard, then I would separate them. You would yeah. separate them by how far? Um, I'd give them quite a bit of distance. I would grow them at different times. Yeah, that's how I'd isolate them. Because otherwise, I mean, how much land do you have? Because they can, they can be bee pollinated, and so you know, you've got a problem there, or insect pollinated. 
Uh, and so staggering by time is really good. Uh, harvest, it's going to be a little pod that turns brown and they tend to shatter quite quickly, most of the ones in that family. I'm not sure about all of them. Uh, I know mizuna and mustard do. So when you see you know, most of the seed pods getting brown, I just cut the seed head and put it in a bag, let it shatter in the bag. Um, so it would be considered a drying process. Peppers. Peppers are, sweet pepper is pretty much a seldom. Uh, I try to grow at least five to 10 because I do see a difference between plants and I like to co collect my best genetics. Like I mentioned before, it will cross with hot pepper if you have hot pepper growing nearby. We, we sometimes grow a, a very a bush type one that has small little sweet peppers on it. And for a while we were growing a hot pepper and, and we'd cut them open and, and uh, you can taste the seeds and the seeds are hot. So we're like, ooh, crust, you know, so then we didn't say seed from those plants. Because what's going to happen is in that generation, you notice I said you taste the seed and the seed was hot, but the flesh was okay as long as you didn't smear the oil from the seed on the flesh when you were cleaning it. And so what's happening is in that first generation, you're getting the same plant, but in the seed, you're getting the cross. So uh, that's what you have to look for. That next generation is when the cross is going to show up. Uh, so it, it's, what, who pollinates this? Pretty much self-pollinated. What can happen is the carpenter bees we don't have bumblebees, but we have carpenter bees, and they're uh, often called robber, robber bees. So they know there's nectar in there, and they'll slit the flower, and they'll get the nectar, and in doing that, they get the pollen on them. So they can uh, cross them. I haven't seen the carpenter bees do that. Like The bumblebees on the mainland were really bad at robbing and slitting. We call it slit the throat of the flower, and, and then you can have a cross. So I, like I said, I've been growing a lot of pepper here on the island um, for a number of years. I've never seen it in crossing. And I grow several varieties of sweet, sweet pepper. Um, harvest, it's a wet harvest. So the seeds are inside the pepper, right? So that's what we call wet. But the nice thing about pepper is you can save the seed and eat the, you know, eat your plant or eat your fruit. So you just want to pop it out and um, easiest to, you know, it's on a little core, and the seeds are all stuck around that little core. And I just rub those seeds off into a little bowl and set it on my counter and you know, keep track of it for maybe a week. And um, one thing you can do is just kind of take the seed and push your fingernail in it or take your other fingernail, try to bend it up. If it's still bendy, it's not dry. So you don't want to store it yet. And we'll talk about um, saving the seed and storing the seed. Uh, in, in a little bit. Um, so that's pepper. Tomato, sulfur, right? It's an annual. We all know it go, grows, goes, makes fruit. The fruit is, the seed is in the fruit, so it's wet process. Doesn't need this. What would you guess about this? Breeder or outcrosser? It's a, it's a selfer, so not as much, but can happen if you have bees around. Uh, but pollination is, is by wind, and if you're growing it in a greenhouse, you'll, you'll hear people say, shake the plant, shake the plant. Because what happens is, the way it grows, the way in which the flower grows, the uh, male part is down, and so the pollen travels down to the female receptive organ, and so uh, the wind does, by shaking the plant, does that. Um, but you can get crossing. We, we pretty much have never had, have we? we've never had crossing. Um, so, it, you know, isolation distance, we do isolate the varieties. I would, I really wouldn't grow like 
several varieties of tomato together. If I wanted to keep seed purity, I'd probably grow, you know, some over here and then, you know, someplace else on the property here, here, here. Not that far. You know, I don't know. What would you say? Hard to say. Yeah, because there's a big goal like this. Yeah. <laughs> Spaghetti lot. Um, we, t we said it's a wet, wet process. Now, actually, a tomato is a wet and fermented process. So we ferment the seeds. We're going to go to that in a bit here with papaya. Um, and same with uh, drying it. Um, one thing, when, when I ferment tomato seed, and then I, and they're very small, the seeds are very small, and then you put them, don't, don't dry them on a paper towel. <laughs> because unless you want to plant a paper towel and all the seeds together, because they just stick. They just, you really can't get them off. And when you're scraping, scraping them off, you're, you're really, you can be destroying the seed coat. So. Um, I've taken tomatoes and spread the seed on the paper towel, and then I just cut up the paper towel so that there's one seed in the Oh yeah, you're making. And, and that works great. Seed strips, and you can do that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, you mentioned the importance of having things like bees, and I, I, so maybe there's different varieties around on the island, but are there things you can do to encourage the bees to come into your yard, certain maybe flowers or plants that you can grow? Or? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, plant, they love basil. Um, they love all the umbilifers. They like the fruit, a lot of the fruit trees. Um, if you have ohia, they love ohia. <laughs> but in terms of coming to pollinate your plants, we grow a lot of basil. And cilantro. Those types of plants are really good pollinator plants. Um, this chiso, when it was blooming, and it'll and it'll bloom up, starting at the bottom, just like basil does, and it'll go up the plant, and it was just covered with bees. It was like, oh my God. we have beehives, but still, we never really see the bees like that. Um, so yeah, like making pollinator zones, and that's something um, that. Uh, a group of people are going to be working on is the whole pollinator campaign program and education around it and looking at what flowers because a lot of the flowers that, um, that are grown on the mainland don't do well in all parts of Hawaii but that's a whole nother thing like maybe they'll do better higher I have trouble growing rosemary or lavender rather but I see it growing up in Waimea all the time beans beans and peas um, there are no hybrid beans because they are so hard to cross, cross them. They said, I read that Luther Burbank tried to cross and create hybrid beans and was only successful 4% of the time. So this is the hot thing to grow if you just really don't want to have to pay too much attention. And it's so fun to grow lots of varieties of beans. Um, and to look at growing beans at different times of the year, we. Uh, about two years ago ordered uh, I don't know, five varieties of heirloom beans and, and said let's what if we grew these uh, in every season and how would they do and there was a big difference some one variety two varieties did well all through the whole growing season the rest they wanted the dry beans really tend to be a dry crop they like it when it's hot and dry um, they don't get as much disease. There's not as much pressure from the Japanese beetle. And, um, and that can be a problem with beans in terms of uh, damage. Plant spacing, you could probably grow them. You know, I, I'll grow one row of beans. And I, I tend to grow mostly pole beans. And then the next row I'll grow another variety. And throughout the whole garden I'll do that. I've never had crossing. Happen. So you can grow them quite close. You can grow them in pots. Um, so isolation is very minimal. Population size, you know, I'd say at least five to ten plants. And you know, you some of the beans you want. To, some of the beans are good when they're green and dry. Some of the beans are better when they're green than when they're dry. And why do I say that? Uh, I base it on cooking. When I make my selection or I say I'm going to grow this, it's like, how long do I have to soak that bean and cook it for to make it tender? 
So I see a big difference in the varieties. Now, some of the green beans you buy, the bush beans, you can dry those seeds, and they're, pre they're pretty good dried seeds. You could go to the health food store and go in their bulk bins, and you could, you know, buy a bag of those and and uh, plant them and see what, you know, they'll, they'll probably grow. Uh, maybe not every one, depending on how long they were stored there. And that's one thing to think about when you're sourcing your seed and you're getting it from the grocery store, and you're getting it from the hardware store. How long has it been there? Um, and do they turn the air conditioning off at night so you have this hot, cold, hot, cold, which really reduces the germination percentage in seeds. So you want to think about that. You know, you really, when you source your seeds, and I didn't say this, but just think of quality in is quality out. If you're going to get them from a seed chair station, know that person. If they hopefully wrote their email, talk to them about it. So you know, if you're going to really grow that to seed, you want to know what that quality is. Or if you go to a seed exchange, talk to the grower. Really find out if they know what they're doing. How long have they been growing that? What, how does it do? do? Did it do well in my location? So, um, you know, those are you know, back to seed sourcing. But. Do you want to talk about how harvesting? Oh, right. Like the pigeon peas. Yeah, and I'm going to include pigeon peas in this. Harvesting beans, again, I've seen a real big difference in variety. Um, like I said, with right now we're dry, and I'm growing out kind of a rare theme that was given to me by someone who uh, was doing work with Baker's Creek and um, they, they want a seed increase, they want more seed. So um, we've been growing this out. I really like this bean, it's a little lima bean, there's about three seeds in each pod. Sometimes I'll base my what I want to grow on, how many beans am I going to get in each pod. Um, I, I've eaten these green but not in quantity because I'm trying to raise seed. So right now it's dry, and they're, they're just drying real nice. I don't know if you can hear uh, But it dry, it's drying real nice on the, on the vine. Uh, but when we were getting the wet weather, I was picking them because I didn't want them to sprout inside. And also, the other thing, uh, different varieties are more susceptible to this, to sprouting inside, but also to getting the bean weevils in. So, have any of you opened up a bean pod and you know, it's full of little holes and beetle frats and really nasty? And pigeon pea is really a good one for doing that. There's, the beetles really get in it. And um, whether they make a little hole in the pod or there's actually the, the pod starting to split open and they get in there then, you know, it, they can do it both ways. Some bean varieties um, will split very easily and you have to really watch harvesting because they'll just drop to the ground. And it's called shattering. So they shatter easily and these don't. So sometimes when I'm saying, do I like this variety? It's like, dries nicely on the vine, doesn't shatter, haven't seen weevils in it, cooking, you know, you do your evaluation. Um, how easy is it to, to shell this bean? I have a bean called Wawa Wa Wonder, which is a wonderful bean. It's great, it's great uh, green, even when it gets big and bumpy. Um, it's a good bean, and you can eat, eat it over a long period of time. It's a good producer, it likes to grow in the summer better, but um, when you try to shell that bean, when it dries, it kind of shrink wraps around the bean. And I, I don't know if some of you have seen this. And so then I'm like, <laughs> try, you know, it's really a lot of work. So. I would say I wouldn't grow that bean, even though it's lovely cooked, it's like a big navy bean. Um, it is just too hard to shell. And I'm sure that there's some machinery out there somewhere that rubs it just the right way and shells it. But, um, so uh, peanuts, peanuts are, um, usually people here don't grow a lot of different varieties of peanuts. I grow one variety I got in Indonesia. Um, uh, they are be pollinated, so if you did grow several varieties, they would outcross, but for the most part, people don't. Um, and you want to plant your peanuts uh, kind of in the fall, when at the vegetative stage, they're getting a lot of moisture, because they're, you know, they're going to really, um, they don't like to be dry. But then, once they flower, 
and you start to see the plant. It's like tar. You start to see the plant kind of turning a little yellow, leaves getting smaller, and it's producing the peanuts underground, and you want it then to be more dry because if it's, the ground's wet all the time, you're, they're going to sprout in the pot. The other problem we have with peanuts is the rats now and the mongoose now know all the places we tend to grow peanuts. And they tend to get their first. It's really discouraging because we have a lovely peanut that we like to grow. Um, so it is bee pollinated. Plant spacing can be really close. You know, just usually you want to do them, you know, so the soil's nice and loose. Uh, because you've got a root crop happening, you know, the little rhizomes. So we plant them about 15 inches apart. The plant will get about well, like this, sprawl around a little bit. If they do sprout in the pod, I just go plant them in a pot and replant them when they get big enough to put out again, um, all the sprouted ones. So you can use the sprouted seeds. You can eat them too. So it, it would be an outcrop doesn't mean that. Population size, I'd say about 20 plants minimum. Just again, because you want to get the variety and it is an outcrosser. Um, harvest it when, after you see the plant kind of shrinking back, it's no longer flowering, it's starting to look dry. And hopefully that's in the dry time of the year. So I just uh, dig them out of the ground and take the whole um, plant. I don't pull the peanuts off yet and just hang that up to dry. And then when it's dry, I pull the peanuts off. And so that's a dry process. Rice. <laughs> I actually grew rice for the first time this year. I got, I went to uh, Timor and to a village that has all their traditional varieties. And I got some rice from an old traditional variety. And the reason I got it is because they grow it like a garden crop, so it's a dry, like, totally dry land. You put it in your vegetable garden and grow it like that. Um, you do have to protect it from the birds, because once they get, get it, they, they go for it. But it is um, definitely, you, you don't have to isolate it, you just have to protect it. And I spaced them. Um, I know when they do the wet variety, they start out growing them very close together, uh, in kind of a nursery situation, and then they take the trays out and they plant them out in the fields wider. With this dry variety, and I would say here in Hawaii, that's really what we should be growing. And um, you can see me, I'll be happy to share seed with you. Uh, I got a nice crop, I just don't know how to get the shell off of it yet. Um, I think in Japan they have a machine that you can do that with. And I've tried pounding them, like, you know, I saw in the village, you know, the young girls were pounding them in a big uh, hollowed out uh, log. And so I took my thing that I make, my wooden thing I make, my papaya salad with and pounded them. And, and it did, most of it came off, but I smashed up the rice pretty good, so it wasn't a great technique. So harvesting and processing is a little bit tricky. It's wind pollinated. And um, you're probably not going to be growing lots of varieties of rice, so you probably don't have to worry a lot about isolation. How much sun do they need? It's a sun, yeah. All of these plants we've talked about so far really do best in the sun. Lettuce in the summertime will do good in some shape. Um, so rice, uh, it's like the peanuts. Started in the wet season and then harvest. I mean, it started in fall when you're going to get lots of, you know, more rain. Because it does want to stay moist, but it doesn't have to be flooded.